and the knowledge does not stop uh, on this journey of better understanding what is Web3 and why you should really care, we have put together a stellar panel um, with, I would say, you know, three perfect different perspectives, right? The investor perspective, an engineer's perspective, and of course, the community side of perspective, and moderating this conversation will be a esteemed journalist and podcaster. So we have Chase Chapman, who is a DAO contributor at Index Co-op and a co-founder and advisor at Decentology. Gabby Goldberg, uh, an investor over the uh, churning group. Patrick uh, Rivera, who is a product engineer over at Mirror and moderating what will undoubtedly be a fascinating panel discussion is Lauren Shin, who's a crypto journalist and podcast and host at Unchained Podcast. Uh, it was Laura, sorry, my apologies. So over to Chase, Gabby, Patrick, and Laura. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to our panel. What is Web3 and why should everyone care? And just to start, why don't we have each of the panelists give a brief overview of how it is that you got into crypto and what you do in crypto. So why don't we start with you, Gabby? Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and uh, chat with this awesome panel of friends. Um, I actually got into venture, or I, I got into Web3 venture because I was investing in an early stage Web2 consumer previously at Bessemer Venture Partners and before that Chapter One. And I was working with a lot of creator tools and consumer marketplaces that were kind of preaching about this idea of a new internet where people could make money online, right? The creator economy is a, is a term that we've all heard. And I felt like the tools actually only brought us halfway there. So a couple examples really quickly. I was working with uh, an app that was basically trying to act like a paid Finsta. So if you're a big creator and you wanted to connect more intimately with your followers, you could download the separate app and pay well your account for five, 10, $20 a month and chat more intimately with your followers. Um, the problem was because this was hosted on the app store, 30% of any revenues that they made would go back to Apple. So maybe if you're a big company hosted on the app store, 30% is just a line on your balance sheet. But for a creator, it's a lot of money. Another experience I had was a couple months ago, actually more recently, uh, I think we all remember the day that all of the Facebook apps went down. Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, they all went down for a day, um, no warning. And I think that was the first time that a lot of creators who run businesses on Facebook or own their relationship with their audience on Instagram realized for the first time that if these platforms go down tomorrow, what do I have? Uh, so I realized there had to be a better way. Uh, I decided to move to the Churnin Group to focus on their investments at the intersection of consumer and crypto because I felt like if this space were to reach mass scale and if these tools were to be used widely, the people building and investing in the space needed to deeply understand and care about messaging, marketing, brand building, and, and this concept of accessibility. So that's how I decided to move over. And Chase, what about you? Yeah, I got into crypto um, actually in like 2018 when I was working in marketing, doing data analytics, and we ran into all these challenges with data provenance. And so I had kind of a strange introduction to all of this because the whole blockchain sort of movement was actually coming from this place of just like, how do we track data? Um, and so from there, sort of fell down the rabbit hole, got more involved in the community, ended up uh, co-founding a company that's doing developer tooling, built that while I was in college, and then really got sort of obsessed with DAOs and, and with building what I think is the future of work. And so now I'm, I'm full-time DAO. I still advise on my company, but I'm, I'm diving headfirst into the, the ecosystem of DAOs and having a lot of fun doing it. Great. We, we should chat because I did a TEDx talk on exactly this issue because I agree with you. I think people are going to be working in a decentralized fashion and be uh, self-employed <laughs> a lot more than they are now. Um, okay, so Patrick, how about you? How'd you get into crypto and what do you do now? Yep, so I first heard about crypto 2017. I was still in school and there's a few people in class. They weren't paying attention. They're on their phones. And I thought they were doing like Angry Birds, but they're on this app Coinbase, <laughs> just trading random tokens. I'm like, what is going on here? It's like, this looks like, yeah, this just looks like gambling or just something scammy. And so at that point I was like, all right, Seems kind of interesting, I guess, but not really for me. And then a couple of years later, ended up getting in touch with a team called Dharma and decided to join after yeah, just meeting the team, thought they're really smart, didn't really know too much about crypto blockchain at that point, but just felt the team was strong, 
and thought it was interesting technology product problem. Was there for a little under a year and then decided to leave because, yeah, that was like in the middle of DeFi summer. And at the time, yeah, I thought it was still similar to the time in college where it's like, okay, people are just buying, speculating on these assets. But then now looking back, it's like, oh, no, this is like a new, these are new incentives for coordinating people digitally in, in a way that isn't, yeah, it's not hierarchical, not based on some sort of like traditional structure. And yeah, and over the next few months, I was into creator economy and then saw NFT starting to pop up and realized that, yeah, NFTs could be a new primitive for allowing creators to fund their work, to monetize, and also for communities to coordinate and have a way of membership. And there's a lot of other stuff in the future, but that's really what intrigued me most recently. All right. Yeah, I, I have to mention that uh, on the 22nd, I have a new book coming out and it will be all about how the ICO craze happened. So you guys should read it because I dive very much into that period that you discussed when you first stumbled upon crypto. Um, OK, so we're here to discuss Web3. Why don't we um, also have you each talk about what the word Web3 even means to you? And anybody can go first. Yeah, this is say, a fun question. <laughs> go yeah, ahead. You got it. You got it. I feel like the first stab at this is always going to be hard. Um, maybe I'll give the precursor to what Patrick is thinking. So I personally use the terms Web3 and crypto interchangeably. I know a lot of people don't, but I want to sort of set that stage. To me, ultimately, we can dive into what all of this means, but like Web3 is sort of the evolution of the internet to be more democratic. So when you think about the way that societies have evolved, we've seen sort of smaller groups and then you go to larger groups where we tend to have these like hierarchical structures. Ultimately, a lot of, of different sort of nations and parts of the world have moved towards more of a democratic model where everyone has a say in what's going on um, and how things are governed. And I think what we've seen over the past few sort of like decades of the Internet that has now um, sort of permeated our lives in every single way, and the pandemic has made that um, even more so, I see Web3 as this evolution towards a, a digital version of democracy where everyone's voice is heard. And it happens to often be built on um, you know blockchain technology or crypto or whatever you want to call it, but I think fundamentally it's about um, a digital democracy. Yeah, yeah, very similarly. I feel like Web three it makes sense in the context of like what is Web one, Web two, and like one framing that I really like that's tossed around a lot is like one is like the read only era of the web where it's like static websites, it's like low bandwidth. It's a lot of like physical goods, marketplaces like eBay, Amazon. So that's web one. And then web two, that's read write paradigm. And so that's not just reading data, static content, but that's also being able to engage with the content that's comments, likes, following, things of that nature. And then also characterized by new technologies and computing platforms like mobile phones with GPS sensors, cameras, et cetera. And then also like cloud computing to make it much cheaper to build applications, infrastructure, et cetera. So that's web two. And then web three is read, write, own. And so you have read, you have write, but then the ownership piece, it's really interesting because a lot of people in the context of ownership, they say like token ownership, but it's not just that. It's also data in the form of like all the information is on this public blockchain. And then also in, in the form of identity, if, if you hold say like in some sort of identifier, like an ENS domain, yours, as long as you, yeah, you renew it every year, every couple of years. And so I think that, yeah, this third area is characterized by another new computing platform, like Web2 is mobile and cloud. And then now I really just view blockchains as a computing platform, has certain properties, like it's like distributed, it's secured by cryptography, it has a few other properties as well as global, internet native, et cetera, et cetera. And so really this Web3 is about apps that are built on that new type of computing platform. So that's stuff like tokens and cryptocurrencies, but it's also like DeFi protocols that's NFTs, that's games built under this computing platform, computing paradigm, and a lot of other things as well. Yeah, and just to jump in, because I actually don't know kind of the knowledge base of the audience here, but for uh, when you said ENS, that's like Ethereum name service. So like on Twitter, if you see someone's name and it's like Laura.eth, it's you know a place where instead of zero X and then it's like gobbledygook, you can just send um, crypto to somebody's human readable uh, a crypto address. Okay, and um, Gabby, what's your yeah. take on what Web3 means? Yeah, I love both of these answers. Um, 
And I agree with Patrick that you really can't explain Web3 without doing some homework and kind of understanding the history of the internet and how we got here and maybe where we might have gone wrong along the way. Um, And for anyone listening who doesn't know anything about Web3 or maybe is sort of skeptical about it and is trying to learn more, I think something that at least was a misconception for me when I was getting into the space was I thought that Web3 was both new technology as well as a new value system. And I would argue that, yes, the technology is new, but the values of Web3 are very similar to why the internet was created in the first place. So when you think of Web1, um, this is the early 90s, the internet was created in 1989, and it was essentially created with this vision of a decentralized and open network of information. Um, And in this internet, users were in control, not centralized platforms. It's important to note that during Web1, the user experience was pretty bad. Uh, the only people who could really engage on the internet were people who knew how to build on these open protocols. Um, but we saw companies emerge like Google, Yahoo, Amazon, et cetera. And then we move into web two, which is essentially until the present, um, where we saw those platforms reach scale and we saw consumers migrate from open services, open protocols to these more centralized ones that were more sophisticated. And here's where we kind of get to the trade-off. It was definitely a good thing moving to these more sophisticated services because it gave billions of people access to the internet and kind of created the internet internet that we all know and use today. But it was also tough because when these centralized platforms are in control, it makes it harder for individuals, groups, and businesses to innovate and create new technology, um, kind of like the examples I gave at the beginning. Um, so in my view, Web3 is just a combination of the best parts of Web1 and Web2. It's decentralized like Web1, but it has a really powerful consumer experience like Web2. So Gabby, you kind of led us to my next question, which is that a lot of people, when they look at Web3, they see that it could actually solve some existing problems that we have with our current internet or with Web2. So can you guys talk a little bit about what you think the, the problems are with the current internet and then how Web3 addresses those? And anybody can go first. (laughs) Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, so I spent a lot of time thinking around what's dubbed as creator economy, online communities. And so in terms of Mirror, the company I'm working at now, we think a lot about that. And yeah, what are the problems today with with different, like say social media platforms? So yeah, with say Instagram, for example, you post to Instagram, but every piece of content that you post is basically stored on databases that they controlled and you're not able to port that content to some other application or platform. Then also not just the content, which a lot of people focus on, but what's probably more important is actually the follow graph and the social graph. So it's the people that follow you and also the people that you follow and also all the information that's built like between those connections, like all the times you've liked someone else's photo, all the times you've commented, et cetera. And so with that information, it's all basically stored within Instagram's environment, or I guess Meta's and yeah, servers, et cetera. And the big difference, the big paradigm shift is that in Web3, instead of this corporation being the platform, right now the community is the platform, the holders of this digital asset, that's really the platform. And so one of my favorite Web3 communities is Friends with Benefits. And so that community is not beholden to any specific Web3 application. It's really, if you hold this token, anybody holds this token and then you import that token into apps. And so instead of you going to these different applications and you're in that environment and all the rules are dictated by them, now you bring your tokens, you bring your assets to different applications. And if something happens then you can just go to a different application that has similar features. So I think that's really like the fundamental paradigm shift. And I think that, yeah, that really creates different affordances around, yeah, like lower switching costs. So being able to, and have better experiences. And then also with these tokens, it has like programmable business models, which we can talk around with royalties and things of that nature. But I think that's like the fundamental difference that that I see. Yeah, Patrick mentioned switching costs, which is something at least from the venture perspective, we think a lot about essentially like, what does it take for a consumer to move from one platform to another? And Web3 is very interesting because the switching costs are basically zero, right? And maybe enterprise SaaS, the switching costs are pretty high and it's pretty hard to move from one service to the next. In consumer, like if I decided I wanted to use Facebook or I I didn't want to use Facebook tomorrow, I I could stop using it. And the switching costs are much lower in consumer. And that's why it's very hard to build in consumer social, for example. In Web3, the switching costs are essentially zero because if you have ownership of your data, you can move from place to place, right? 
Think of it like Gmail, for example, uh, like email is an open protocol, SMTP. And that's why we have all of these different front ends for email, Gmail, webmail, hotmail, superhuman, self-hosted email. And if I decided tomorrow that I wanted to switch from one to the next, I could actually take all of that with me and it's fine. If I decided tomorrow that I didn't want to use Facebook, there's no alternative, right? You're kind of stuck. And so from a venture perspective, I mean, something that's very appealing for investors in Web3 is, at least I believe, the products that are built on top of permissionless protocols, because there's more competition, there will be more innovation and the products will literally just be better and they'll serve consumers better. Yeah, I think the other way to look at this is like, the pandemic definitely catalyzed our amount of living online. <laughs> and I think that's made a lot of people sort of face the fact that living and doing a lot of things digitally today doesn't really feel great in a lot of ways. Um, and ultimately, I think that's because when you think about the majority of the tools that we're using, they're owned by companies that are maximizing often user retention and profit, like at the end of the day. And I don't think that we can fault them for doing that. But I think a lot of the challenges when you sort of back that up into the ownership concept is like the reason that online sort of sucks today when you think about the richness of real life versus the richness of, you know, spot time that we spend on the internet is because you're using those platforms that are owned by single companies that are profit maximizing. And so I think when you think on like a 10 year time horizon, if you think that we're only going to spend more time digitally, what doesn't feel good or make sense is like living in Facebook's metaverse, at least to me. Um, and so like, even as I spend more time in VR, I'm like, oh my God, I hope that Facebook does not own this because this feels not good. And so I think ultimately a lot of this shift isn't just about solving, you know, the problems that are arising based on how we use the web today. I think it's about looking forward and looking at digitally, how are we going to exist 10 years from now? And then what needs to change from an ownership perspective for that to feel good and like a rich experience rather than one that's sort of being manipulated and created by a company that you don't necessarily trust. And I think that's one of the things that I'm super excited about when it comes to web three sort of solving some of those problems isn't just like, okay, fundamentally ownership's a problem, but it's like, when you change ownership and you change who has a say and who who's actually like making these decisions and what you're optimizing for, I think that becomes super, super interesting. I, I should just disclose, I write a newsletter for bullets, a bulletin newsletter, which is owned by Meta. Um, but, you know, here we've been discussing kind of, you know, what are all the potentials with Web3 and, um, you know, the different problems with Web2. But once this technology is more built out and more mature, what do you think our lives will look like? And, you know, Chase, you kind of started to describe that. Um, but yeah, maybe you uh, and, and the others could give us a little more flavor. To me, I think this is one of the most like interesting broad questions. When I'm thinking about things like VR and AR and all of the different technologies that we're starting to see really come close to like mainstream consumer adoption that have been, you know, in development for quite a while. Um, I actually think that a lot of what Gabby and, and Patrick are sort of hinting at with these like open spaces where anyone can create experiences on top of this world actually gets us to a place where the internet looks a lot more like the real world. So when you think about things like NFTs or even like DAOs, ultimately what we're getting to is fair ownership, fair experiences, fair ability to build on top of all of these things in a really open way. Um, and so I personally see it as something that sort of makes everyone a creator of their experiences. You know, when you think about like DIY in the real world, which is, is kind of like a funny analogy. I actually think that like the internet will very much turn DIY where it's like, what would it look like to create your own platforms for you and your friends? Um, and so that's kind of where I hope it goes. And actually yeah. before we move, oh, keep going, go ahead, uh, Gabby. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I love that answer. There's something I think about a lot. I think this is a Benedict Evans quote and he says, when tech is fully adopted, it disappears. So if you look at like Google trend search history for the word like software. It had a bell curve and it like went down or mobile had a bell curve and went down. And if you look at web three, it's still going up, meaning we're like definitely not at full adoption. Um, but I think it's really going to serve as a very powerful infrastructure layer that uh, the mass majority of consumers, the vast majority of consumers won't be thinking about every day. It's just going to power what they do. And the really exciting thing 
is so much of the really incredible use cases and applications that can be built on top of this technology just quite honestly haven't been built yet. Um, I think there's one cool example, like Syndicate DAO, for example, it essentially turns any uh, wallet or it turns a group of people into sort of like an investment DAO where uh, they can pool capital and invest in other projects. Currently, um, and Chase, you should definitely touch on this as well at some point because you're you're closer to this space than I am, but it seems like a lot of DAOs organize around a mission and then because a lot of these tools aren't built out, they end up spending actually a lot of their time just figuring out how to DAO, right? Like, how do you think about governance? How do you organize? What tool should we be using? And tools like Syndicate, as an example, are a huge unlock because they take away, how do you DAO? And instead you can just focus on what you care about. Um, so I think generally in Web3, like these new experiments are gonna be leveraged in ways that we haven't even realized, you know, like DAOs for coordination and NFTs for kind of commerce and incentive alignment. Um, we haven't even really scratched the surface yet, which is why it's so exciting. Yeah, and I feel, yeah, there's just so much to talk about. And so it's like, I would even start and feel like, yeah, you know, both Chase and Gabby's points around, yeah, it's like so much is still to be created. And so it is very speculative. And so it's very easy for the detractors to be like, oh, nothing's built yet. All oh, this experience is horrible, but yeah, I feel like one of the things that is really interesting is like this process of co-creation in the future. And right now it's like, if you have an artist on Spotify, they're producing their music, they have a team behind them, maybe a record labeled, the streams go through like this really like gnarly web of, yeah, just like giving 10% here, 5% here, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, it's not super transparent and there's not really much of a, yeah, a relationship between fans and the artists. Basically, if you go to a concert, that's pretty much the closest you can get, or maybe if they have like a Discord, but it's probably gonna be run by someone on their team. But I think now what I'm really interested in are gonna be these creator DAOs, where it, basically whenever you start generating revenue on chain through different like Web3 apps, that's not gonna to go to a bank account and gonna be used to pay for things specific to the artists or their team. It's gonna to go to an on-chain treasury at least a portion of that revenue is going to go to an on-chain treasury and that's going to be controlled by the listeners, by the audience, by people in the community. And I think that's going to be really interesting where, you know, what if there's a Billie Eilish world tour organized by the fans or Billie Eilish merch that's created by the fans or Billie Eilish yeah, label or et cetera. And so I think that that's going to be really interesting, like this process of co-creation. So earlier um, when Chase was talking, I did want to, um, cause you know, you started talking about like what, well, web three will, look like when we're all a kind of using these technologies, but you earlier in your introduction said that you already, you know, only work for DAOs. So what does that mean? Just tell us a little bit more about like what your life is like and how that works. Yeah. So for anyone who isn't familiar, DAO, which is D-A-O, stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which is like a bunch of just big words that essentially just mean a group of people who co-own something together, um, very much along the lines of like what Patrick is talking about. So Billie Eilish could have an entire DAO that manages her brand. When you look at like traditional organizations, companies look kind of like DAOs, co-ops are a much better sort of thing to look at to kind of understand what a DAO could look like, though I think we're going to blow up what that actually means. But there have been lots of DAOs in Web3 as of recently that have built things like product um, or investing, like what Gabby is talking about. And so it's people who come together, create something cool, whether that be an investment collective or a product, and then they co-own it and they govern it together. So basically I full-time work for a bunch of different DAOs um, and organizations that are involved with DAOs. And so what that essentially looks like is um, almost like what you would traditionally think of as like a freelancer, but um, sorry if you can hear the loud construction in my apartment, but um, their DAOs basically make that possible where rather than being a freelancer who gets paid in cash by companies and doesn't really see upside from the work I'm creating, I'm effectively getting paid in ownership. And of course, because of some of the, the things that Web3 introduces, it's traditionally like liquid ownership. And so there's kind of this entire new model for what it looks like to be someone who provides value, who works for different organizations, but who also gets to see upside instead of that upside sort of concentrating to investors and like founders of, of a given project. So it's so interesting that you ended on that because as I'm sure people are well aware, Web3 is actually a controversial word these days. 
And, you know, so far in this conversation, we've really just been talking about kind of what are the um, kind of positives that are seen with Web3 or like what are like the, the what's the rose colored glasses view of Web3, but very prominent people who are very deep in technology, such as Jack Dorsey, the former CEO of Twitter, current CEO of Block or um, which is formerly Square. He's criticized Web3 and has said that it's really just owned by VCs. So what is your response to criticisms like that? I mean, I can start as a VC. (laughs) Um, Absolutely, the venture industry is getting disrupted, which I think is incredible. Syndicate is just one example, but crypto absolutely democratizes access to one capital and then two uh, ownership in all of these platforms in a way that was never allowed before. Um, what it does for us, at least on the venture side, is it puts a lot more pressure on us to actually be value add outside of our capital alone. And so at least now, obviously I'm biased, but I believe there's a place for venture in this ecosystem to kind of scale Web3 to the masses, um, especially from a place like the Trinan Group, which has a lot of experience just in digital consumer and then bringing that into Web3 media and, and Web3 consumer platforms. Um, but in general, we're seeing it change so much and there's never been so much opportunity to contribute and earn and be a part of something as there is in Web3. And one example I really like to that point, 100%, I do believe that, yeah, there's still a place and a role for VCs in terms of like early risk capital, especially for some of these businesses that you need like millions of dollars in order to hire a team, et cetera, and do certain things. And I think one big difference now is that teams are raising much less money. And so for example, because there is, this leverage of having open protocols that you're building on top of. And so instead of hiring 500 people doing a series A, then a series B, then a series D, then a series whatever, whatever, and then getting to a thousand employees before you IPO or 1500, thousands of employees. One example is Uniswap, where they had at the time when they launched their token, they probably raised, don't quote me on this, but anywhere from like 10 to $20 million. And they had around like 20 to 30 full time employees. And then they basically launched their token, their governance token, and they rewarded people that had used the Uniswap protocol. And so at that point, then I don't know the exact percentages, but let's say like compared to when a company IPOs in the past, it's like a large percentage is owned by investors, owned by the early team. And then the public, they only get the scraps after you know, the IPO, the investment bankers, et cetera, et cetera. And then in this case, it was actually the people using the protocol, they're rewarded with the tokens and a large percentage of the tokens in circulation were owned by community members. And of course, there's the reality is that there's people, there's whales, there's investors that are able to scoop up a lot of them. But at least that model, I think we're going to get better at it over time and have more clever ways of incentivizing people. Like right now, you have this, this idea of an airdrop where if you use this product, you get some tokens where there's easy ways to gain that by creating multiple accounts. And so I think over time, we'll create better systems for that. But I think the cool part is that now value is programmable. It's just inside of the smart contract and its code, as opposed to being this legal contract, you need to get lawyers and need to go to a stock exchange and do all that. And but I do think there needs to be like more standards in place and, and so a lot more infrastructure in place and best practices. Yeah, I would add the other thing is like, fundamentally, I think Web3 is probably going to change some of the relationship between capital and labor. And traditionally, digitally, capital hasn't really included ownership in most cases for the reasons that that Gabby and Patrick both talked about. And so I think when we're thinking about the role of, you know, venture capital now versus in the future, I think we're kind of seeing like a weird bridge between um, web two and web three. And, and I think that's why you're seeing some of what Gabby is talking about, where you have like investors really having to sort of show that they have value add. Um, longer term, I think there's definitely going to be some, some changes when we think about like what something like just capital means versus all other kinds of capital and, and how we actually value that, which is much more transparent and open in web three. Like even though um, there's still capital coming in, it's certainly a lot easier to understand who's actually holding what percentage of you know, a given token supply than it, than it would traditionally be in Web 2. So a lot of that transparency too, I think actually makes quite a big difference. Yeah, one thing that was curious to me was, um, so one of you mentioned that you're in Friends with Benefits, which is basically more like a social club that is a DAO. So there is, you know, a token and you need 75 of them in order to uh, get access to kind of the main part of, of the DAO. 
And interestingly, Andreessen Horowitz invested in that. <laughs> um, but it, it's it's basically a social club, right? So what's your take on like why that happened or why it was necessary or or if you think it wasn't necessary and they're just doing it because they just want to hang out with the cool kids or what's going on with there? What's going on there? I guess just to start, one interesting thing just to level set is oftentimes when venture firms are investing in DAOs, it is certainly not the DAO pitching to the firm. It is the firm pitching to the DAO. Uh, in order to contribute. Um, again, there's so much capital in the space from venture firms, from individuals. FWB doesn't necessarily have a lack of capital, um, but they're looking for contributors who can help scale the organization and make it better. And so um, I don't know if it's our, our place to say whether or not Andreessen should have joined, but they did pitch to the Dow. And I do believe that that was a decision that was made in a decentralized manner. Yeah, actually, um... I had Trevor McFadries, the founder of Friends with Benefits on my show, and he was talking about how when Andreessen pitched them, people in the DAO were like, what snacks do you like? And then they liked the snacks that the Andreessen people were eating. And that was kind of like what got them to agree to let them in. So that was kind of it. It was like, okay, that's your criteria. Okay. Well, the funny part is like, it used to be, okay, you got to go to a Silicon Valley, Sand Hill Road, you know, go and you know, get permission to go into their office and they have like 10 types of kombucha in the lobby and like, like fancy doors and stuff. And then now they're in a discord where half the people, they're just like frog monkey 42 or whatever, and just like random names. And then they're pitching like half the audience and the VCS Chris Dixon was there like pitching the community on why they should take their money, why they should be involved in yeah, I thought that was, yeah, that was like a very good observation by Gabby where it's like, yeah, it's completely different how, how it's done. Yeah, it's still owned by VCs, but at least the process makes it feel like this process of co-creation and co-building. And yeah, I don't, I'm not sure why exactly they wanted to invest, but could speculate that, yeah, it's like a combination of things. It's like signaling that, hey, we believe in this movement. We want to support these communities, these early experiments. And who knows, it's an experiment, but we want to support them. We want to signal that we want to support others like this. And also, yeah, there's, I think that there with FWB, it's to Chase's point, it's like capital versus labor, just the people in that community, they're you know, very interested in Web3 models from the technical side, from the creative side, artistic side. And yeah, I think it's, it's really just like supporting the movement in their own way. So one other topic that I want to be sure to hit, um, because this is sort of integral to Web3, is NFTs. And obviously, they've taken off in a big way, particularly over the last like year, year and a half. Um, but as I'm sure we're all well aware, whenever mainstream companies, I mean, not literally every single time, but often when mainstream companies or um, groups announced that they were going to do something with NFTs, there, we've been seeing a lot of swift backlash from the fans. And so there's kind of, you know, the crypto people who get excited about it and then everybody else who it appears they are not excited about it. Um, so what's your take on what's going on there and how people like you um, should address those criticisms or, or, you know, whether anything can be done about that? This is a fun question. I have a couple different thoughts on it. The first is that Vitalik wrote a while ago about underestimating some of like the, the sort of human, and Vitalik is the co-founder of Ethereum for anyone who doesn't know, which is like one of the biggest sort of blockchains in Web3. Um, he wrote a while ago um, something about like basically underestimating political movements and like the status quo of culture. And I think from a perspective of NFTs, there's a narrative that's sort of gotten, gotten out and gotten adopted um, that isn't necessarily true around like environmental impacts or that is it is certainly ignoring some of like the future plans when it comes to the technology. Um, so anyone who like is concerned about environmental stuff, I would highly recommend doing a little bit more digging on that because there's a lot of changes coming and also a lot of sort of environmental considerations that are definitely misunderstood by that community. The other thing that I've noticed from a Web3 culture perspective is that I think a lot of people no longer care to fight the fight of 
basically trying to get anti NFT people to understand them, which I kind of take as a net positive. Ultimately, I think to Gabby's point about like not knowing really or not caring like or Googling NFTs, you know, 10 years from now, because people will will sort of already know or it will be at the base layer of the, the digital world that we're in. I think ultimately the, the push to build experiences that are highlighting like ownership and unique digital assets and all of that is really, really important to the point where like, I don't know if we should really care whether or not people love NFTs because if they use the technology that leverages them and they understand the important fundamental, you know, ownership aspects, um, I'm not super convinced that it actually matters for us to change change that narrative. But I don't know. I don't know if that's a if that's a good viewpoint to have or not. Gabby, no, I sort Patrick, of agree with you. you. I, I think it, it is kind of two sides of the same coin. We're on. And, and I don't know if I have picked a side, I think both can exist where one, just like Chase said, like a lot of consumers just won't know and maybe will never care and that's okay. And then on the other side, we should do as much as we can, especially in this time to increase education. I mean, the space is really exciting because it's so positive sum. Like we literally all benefit when more people enter the space. Um, and so like the education is definitely like a fight that's worth fighting, but at the same time, there are some people and some groups that maybe will never be able to convert, like particularly the gaming community is a good example of the traditional gaming community. Um, it's also hard because Web3 is certainly not perfect and there's a long way we have to go to kind of solve problems. And so a lot of examples that have kind of reached mass media are just examples of NFT cash grabs, which exist. And there's a lot of capital in the space and there's a lot of ways you can make a ton of money off of NFTs in a bull run. Um, and so I think we kind of like lose the, we lose sight of what the point is where NFTs can allow communities and businesses to raise non-dilutive capital, raise a community of people, create a community of people who are actually incentivized to help it grow and succeed and nurture it from the inside out. Um, and sometimes you don't see that with some of these bigger projects, which is definitely something that should be solved. Yeah, and last thing I'll say to those points, I think that, yeah, there's the, probably the cash grab piece to me that Gabby just mentioned is, is the one that I see a lot of people as well, where it's like people are working very hard for $15 an hour, $20 an hour, $25 an hour. And then you see people paying $150 to buy this JPEG thing that doesn't seem like it makes sense. And then there's all these collections that are doing, you know, like millions of dollars of volume or Board Apes doing a hundred million dollars worth of volume on this like, collection of JPEGs and just doesn't make sense. So I think, yeah, a lot of it is also like just the social dynamic of people just working very hard for, yeah, just to like, pay their rent, have food, put food on the table, buy nice things. And, and then there's just this group of like internet people that are spending like millions of dollars on these JPEGs or tens of thousands of dollars on these JPEGs. And yeah, I feel like that's, that's also one dynamic as well. Can I add to that real quick? I think the other thing to think about for people who are like watching this all unfold is when we talk about like FWB asking A16Z what snacks they like and basing investment decisions on that, like this is a, you see some of that dynamic playing out in the NFT space too, which is I think why it feels ridiculous to some people, but it's very much this like counterculture GameStop-esque you know, vibe in a lot of ways. Now, there are certainly moments and and communities in in the NFT world that are like not based on that. But I think when you when when people see all of this sort of ridiculous money being spent, the other framing to have is like culturally, we very much have this this other swing of the pendulum going from like money is, you know, all of these things that venture capital used to represent to money is a pixelated JPEG that has like a cigarette that it's smoking. And so I think that's the other way to, to frame some of all of the craziness that's happening in the world of NFTs. Yeah. And I think some of the, um, kind of actual events happening in NFTs and DeFi, um, give the critics, you know, some ammunition. Like if we look at the number of rug pulls, you know, I mean, there was one, I, I actually can't remember what it was supposed to be originally, but, you know, basically they were selling what was supposed to be some kind of visual NFT. So like some version of a JPEG. And then after they received the money, they literally swapped out the actual images for pictures of rugs. 
And so people, you know, they thought they were going to buy one thing and then instead they get these images of rugs. And so, I mean, it's, it's like, it's pretty bad. Um, there, there is a lot of stuff going on. And so, yeah, I, I can understand kind of some of the backlash. I do think that the space probably needs to develop more so that, that we don't see as many scams. Um, although I have to say, I, from writing my book, you will see throughout, there's a lot of scams and hacks and not much has changed from the years that my book covers. So anyway, all right. So that is, uh, the portion of the, uh, discussion that is, you know, moderated by me, but we have a number of audience questions. So I will hand it over to Finn to field those. Thank you, Laura. And, and we do indeed. And I, this is actually a great one to start off with. And, and perhaps, um, you can take this first question and we'll maybe also get chase as to, to respond to it as well. So Neil Huzinga asks, there's a lot of use of the words will, he puts in quotes, and when, uh, when talking about Web3. Given that Web3 is also described as read, write, trust, how long do you think it will realistically take for ordinary consumers to trust the decentralized universe and what will be the catalyst? So, of course, he's talking about read, write, trust. So, Laura, maybe you can go first and then Chasing chime in. And then, of course, you know, Patrick and Gabby, if you have additional thoughts, you're welcome to add to it as well. Well, I mean, answering a when question is super, super, super difficult. None of us have crystal balls, but, um, you know, clearly I would say that when the technology develops to a certain point where you get that seamless user experience, that probably will be some kind of milestone. And frankly, that's probably not going to happen until a lot of these scaling issues are addressed. And for anybody who's actually tried to transact on Ethereum at the moment, you will notice that when you try to do a transaction, your gas costs might be in the three figures or depending on what type of transaction you're doing. Sometimes it could be a little less. Um, and it also frankly depends on what time of day you're transacting. But regardless, um, it's quite expensive right now. And that's because there's only so much block space and the demand for the block space exceeds supply. So once kind of we can do more transactions per second, then um, I would imagine that would that would help make that seamless user experience. But, um, you know, it, it at this moment, it definitely looks like it's probably on a multiple years uh, level. I would say uh, just given that right now there's a lot of different scaling solutions in the mix. Um, and, you know, some of them are actually taking certain niches, like for gaming or whatever. And so we might see certain verticals that like take off a little bit sooner than others. But um, I'd be interested to hear what others think on this issue, because, yeah, uh, I think everybody wants to know when, but nobody really, really knows. Well, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Chase? Yeah, I feel like Gabby and Patrick being on the consumer side probably have much better thoughts on this than I do. But I, I think the one thing that's when I talk to people who are asking this exact question that's been helpful is there are definitely already people like me, for example, who are not just like, oh, you know, I'm in the world of web two, but talking about web three and so making a living off of that. But I actually work for DAOs that are actually building things in web three. And so most of my life is already web three. Um, and you're seeing that grow every day where like I get paid by an organization that is a DAO that creates crypto products that enough people buy that are not scammy, but like actually just index funds, for example. Um, and so enough people buy those that I actually get paid by it. And so I think we're seeing like a growing group of people that are impacted by this. I think as you see people switch towards more flexible employment, which like the world of labor, particularly in places like the United States is changing, but globally. Um, and so I think we're going to start to see a lot of these things sort of start to pick up steam in different communities at different times, but there will be more and more of people like me. And ultimately I think that sort of floods over into everything else, but I'm curious what Gabby and Patrick think about this because they they both think more deeply about like consumer sides of Web3. Yeah, I think one thing that um, we haven't specifically touched on yet is this transition um, that I think the three of us have experienced moving away from capital, like what you have and towards what you actually do on chain. And so Chase lives and breathes that. Um, and there are other products and platforms in this space that are really working to kind of encourage that shift. So rabbithole.gg, station.express, really thinking about the future of contributions and coordinations on chain. So maybe the next time you want to join something like FWB, it won't be 
do you have this, right? Like, do you have this token? Do you have this NFT? But it's more of, have you done this? Have you contributed in this place? And it's provable on chain. And I think that's a shift that's really going to accelerate adoption in general, because it's going to make it a lot less about capital. Patrick, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I would say I would echo a lot of the points mentioned. And yeah, Mira, we think a lot about scaling solutions like Laura chatted about, and there's just a lot of things that fundamentally can't happen on a high transaction fee blockchain. And so that's one of the things that we're really excited about where, yeah, what if likes were NFTs? What if following was an NFT? Then you could create some really interesting experiences there. And so until that happens in a way that, yeah, people feel good about and feel like, yeah, doesn't trade off other important properties like security, trust, et cetera. I think that's, that's the time where I'm really excited for we have a question here from Lakeisha Harrison. Um, do you think that Web3 is a step forward in creating a more equitable internet or are there barriers in tech that even Web3 can't overcome with decentralization? So perhaps maybe Gabby and Laura, you could share your insights on this about whether or not we think Web3 is a step forward in creating a more equitable internet or are there barriers in, 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 in the tech that even Web3 can't? overcome yeah i'll be candid with this one i think the thing that i am very conscious about and i think the most about especially kind of in my role of pushing a lot of these projects forward is this idea of you know if we create another world or another ecosystem of more exclusive assets and gatekeeped groups and um you know certain perspectives that are pushed up and others that are brought down like what have we really done right um and so the biggest thing that I think about is accessibility, right? On a human level. And a lot of that comes down to education. It comes down to uh, powerful design and things that people can trust and feel comfortable using. And that's also why I like these conversations so much and talking about this with so many people, because um, if this space doesn't work, I think it will be because of the lack of diverse perspectives and people and backgrounds in the space. And I would say that it will make a more equitable internet in some respects, and then also definitely create inequalities in other respects. And I'll explain kind of like the first case and also also the second case. So in the first case, um, and and this actually will hopefully come through in my book, but um, you know people may know that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto appears to have been either motivated or, or at least have some kind of commentary about how Bitcoin could be a response to what happened with the financial crisis. Um, some of you may know that in the what's called the Genesis block, meaning the first block of the Bitcoin blockchain, he put a headline from a London newspaper about the bank bailouts from the financial crisis. Um, and, you know, it's sort of like commentary about this new decentralized uh, kind of form of money or form of payment versus the centralized one. Um, and interestingly, you know, what I feel like I am wit have been witnessing over the almost seven years now that I've been covering this is, you know, if you look back, um, probably like 80s, 90s, like Wall Street was where a lot of the cachet was. And that's where like a lot of the hot grad, you know, young hot grads would want to go uh, work. And then kind of in the 2000s, it became like Silicon Valley, you know? Um, and then actually now I'm sure you've all seen, there have been a lot of articles about how tech execs are jumping ship to go to crypto. And actually Silicon Valley itself is kind of losing that cachet and the pandemic has only accelerated it, you know, amongst my sources. So many of my sources have left the Bay Area. And even when I just look at the general world of the different um, people who've had, who've had success in crypto, I mean, I have like people who in the Philippines, you know, in a very short period of time became gazillionaires from NFTs or, you know, there's like DeFi people in India that made a killing. And, you know, this when when people talk about how crypto is decentralized, like I actually see it amongst my sources that they're not all in one place. They're all over the world. And, you know, they all became very wealthy in a very short period of time. Um, but that sort of leads me to the point about how, you know, there is going to be still inequality here. And, you know, again, in my book, I also saw the influence that whales have in these systems. I mean, yeah, I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but um, you should read my book. You will definitely get a taste of how whales um, definitely have influence and how they wield it. And yeah, some of the uh, stuff that goes down behind the scenes involving whales. So, you know, I, it's, it's, there's kind of like both things happening essentially. 
I love that. So, uh, Patrick, here's a question for you uh, that Nick asks. Uh, Patrick was talking about Uniswap and, and democracy of value in terms of tech. However, in terms of centralization, not platforms like OpenSea and Alchemy central, not decentralized. I guess, you know, as marketplaces, marketplaces often are described as a centralized place to get all things. So maybe Patrick, you could give us some insights on, on that case and, and maybe Chase, if you have any additional uh, comments on that would be great. Yeah, that's a very, very important question where it's easy on Twitter to just be like, yeah, decentralization is amazing. And all these companies, if you have Web3 in your name or in your Twitter bio, then you're decentralized. But in the reality is that like one way that I look at it is that there's a protocol that's underneath that's decentralized or it can be, has the opportunity to be. And then on top of the protocol, there's a company and then there's multiple projects building on top of the protocol. And so by protocol, what that is exactly is just if you're on Ethereum, the Ethereum blockchain is just code that's written in this language called Solidity. And it basically dictates the rules of the protocol. So for Uniswap, it's okay, you can have two tokens, you create this pool that people can trade against, and then you get rewards, et cetera, et cetera. Or here's the transaction feed. And those are the rules. And so this protocol is decentralized because in the code, nobody can change the rules. Nobody can change the transaction fee unless you meet the certain criteria, say through a governance vote or something of that nature. And so the rules are encoded in the protocol. And that's kind of what it means by decentralized. But then the company Uniswap, they have an app. If you go to app.uniswap.org, there that's a company that yeah it's like a legal entity there's a team there's a headquarters etc cetera, etc cetera. they pay their taxes but they don't really influence the actual underlying protocol they're just building an app where you can access the functionality of the protocol and so like one interesting thing is they've noticed like a couple of years ago when i was at dharma there would be they have this token list uniswap has this token list of tokens that are known scams and obviously they don't want their users to be yeah, buying scammy tokens. And so they, they have a list of tokens that the Uniswap you can't access from the app. But if you go directly to the protocol or if another app wants to allow their users to trade in those tokens, then they can do it. But the actual, so it's different what the Uniswap company and then Uniswap, the actual protocol is. And the protocol will always allow these tokens to be used, but then the actual app and the companies themselves, they get to dictate the rules around, okay, for our app, Again, what do we allow? What do we not allow? And so there's an, a distinction. So the underlying primitives so for Alchemy and OpenSea, the NFTs are decentralized for Alchemy, like the actual like, process of you know, confirming blocks on chain and getting data, that's decentralized, but there's actually an entity, a company that needs to be formed in order to integrate with that between actual customers using the product. That makes a lot of sense. Chase, would you like to give us the, the DAO perspective? Yeah, I think the macro trend that we've seen in crypto and Laura, I don't know if you'd agree with this after covering crypto for many years, but I think is going from centralization to decentralization. So when we talk about something like Uniswap, that's more decentralized than other exchanges. And I think ultimately we'll probably see this in almost every part of, of Web3 where OpenSea today is the centralized version, just like you know Coinbase is the centralized version of an exchange. OpenSea is the centralized version of an NFT marketplace. OpenSea just acquired Dharma, which is the, the company that Patrick used to work at, which actually has on ramps into crypto. So it makes it easy for people to buy crypto that a lot of people think OpenSea acquired them so that they can reach a much broader market of consumers who don't already own crypto. And so I think a lot of the way to think about this is actually that most of the centralized entities that you see really, really doing well in crypto today are doing well because many of them are bridging the gaps between Web 2 and Web 3 that currently exist. I think longer term, many of them will ultimately have some sort of either decentralization process or a decentralized competitor that beats them out, mostly because in the long term, people in crypto, again, want to own the companies that they use. Users expect to own the, the companies and govern them. And so we've already seen a lot of OpenSea competitors launch. None of them have crazy taken off like OpenSea has. That's okay. OpenSea probably is going to have to fight legal battles for the, the NFT industry. And so I think actually generally that's, that's a good thing for now. Again, bridging the gap until we're fully into Web3. Um, so that's kind of the paradigm that I think about. Laura, I don't know if you agree with that after covering um, crypto and seeing that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, actually, there was a period where I thought Coinbase was going to be part of my book. So I have 
kind of done quite a bit of recording on reporting on Coinbase, and I probably should use that information at some point. But um, they're they're kind of primarily a fintech company, actually, at this point. Like they're sort of the main on ramp from fiat to um, crypto, and you know they're, they're kind of like the main place where people tend to get their first access to crypto assets. But what's interesting, and I think this will be kind of very you know fun to watch um, is that Coinbase now I feel recognizes, oh, they probably need to shift with the industry because since the industry is going more decentralized, you know, they've been rolling out like Coinbase wallet and, you know, now they're also trying to get in on the NFT thing because that's where, you know, people are, are, that's, that's another main on-ramp for a lot of normies, but they don't necessarily want to buy crypto assets. Right. And so I kind of like already see that they're trying to do these things like oh, how can we play in this decentralized area in the actual crypto world, not just like be the connection to the banking system? So I think like, yeah, just in that one company alone, we're we're seeing that trend. Brilliant. And on that note, what a fantastic way to end. Laura, thank you for great moderation skills. Chase, Gabby, Patrick, thank you so much for your uh, contributions. It was super, super helpful. Thank you all. Join us back for our last session of the summit. We'll see you back soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.